Anime fans had it rough in the front half of 2021, as we all collectively learned that you can, in fact, have too much of a good thing. We like to think we'd be happy if only our booster packs came packed with secret rares and our anime seasons with instant classics, but in practice, when Super Cub is overshadowed by Dinazanon, is overshadowed by Mars Red, is overshadowed by those Snow White Notes, is overshadowed by Shadow's House, is overshadowed by Nomad Megalobox 2, is overshadowed Overshadowed by Odd Taxi, is overshadowed by Vivi, is overshadowed by 86, is overshadowed by Tokyo Revengers, is overshadowed by Two Year Eternity. <gasps> It gets tough to appreciate all the good fucking food that's actually in front of you. We were in desperate need of a break, and I have never been so happy to see so many mediocre anime in one place. Finally, I'll have time to catch up on all the anime of the year contenders I put on hold for other anime of the year contenders. That said, there are still plenty of new anime this season that are very worth your time, and by watching them, plus all of the ones that aren't, I have put together a list of those for your convenience. These are the ones to watch for summer 2021. Brought to you by Bookwalker, where you can use the promo code BASEMENT to get 600 yen off thousands of high-fidelity, English-translated manga and light novel ebooks, including the source material for four of the ten shows I'm about to recommend. So, if you like any of those enough to want to read ahead, or say you just can't wait to learn what happened after 86's big cliffhanger last season, Bookwalker's got you covered. Especially you 86 fans, as they're currently running a big promotion where you can get up to a 40% coin back on each volume you buy before July 26th. And Bookwalker's always running new promos and sales, so even after that's done, there's always new deals to discover. I'll be updating a pinned comment whenever promos relevant to this video's content go live, so no matter when you're watching this, make sure you check that for great deals on great books. And don't forget to use promo code BASEMENT for an additional 600 yen off. Oh, and uh, just to be clear up front, uh, due to how late in the season they're coming out, I wasn't able to include the Idaten Deities No Only Peace, a seinen action series with a really cool, colorful art style being made at Studio Mappa, so it'll probably be pretty good. Or The Great Jahi Will Not Be Defeated, which is basically the devil is a part-timer, only instead of the world's nicest middle manager, the main character is a sassy lost child who turns into a busty Neko Nason demon lord. Both look like they have potential, so if they're good, I'll let you guys know in a quick follow-up video. With that said, our first entry is actually a spring show, but one that was in Netflix jail until a couple weeks back, and there's almost nothing this season that's anywhere near as good as it, so yeah, go catch up on anime of the year contender Godzilla Singular Point. Like most things Godzilla these days, this original anime from Studio Bones and Rideback director Atsuki Takahashi is packed full of callbacks to and fascinating reinterpretations of both iconic and obscure bits of lore from throughout the franchise's 70-year history. But don't worry if you're not caught up on all your kaiju facts just yet, because Singular Point also packs in plenty of its own personality, with echoes of Satoshi Kone and Steinsgate reverberating throughout a script penned by award-winning science fiction author and physics PhD Toe Enjoy. Whether or not you have the faintest idea what a Jet Jaguar is, you're gonna have a ton of fun watching a ragtag crew of kooky genius mechanics pilot their janky, machine-learning, calibrated garage kit mech into battle against radio-emitting pterosaurs and I mean, if you've heard of this franchise, you, you can guess how things will escalate from there. Though the wild imaginary physics and biology used to explain that escalation are interesting enough and add enough plot wrinkles that Singular Point feels fresh and unpredictable even as it builds up to what it tells you it's going to build up to in its title. Also, with Mob Psycho and My Hero Academia's Studio Bones animating the charming cast of human characters and B-Star's Studio Orange handling the differently charming CG critters and vehicles, it kinda goes without saying that it looks great doing it. Now, while we're on the subject of giant, gorgeous avatars of destruction, Kageki Shoujo should be on the radar of anyone who's recently discovered anything about themselves thanks to Resident Evil Village, if you know what I'm saying. If you don't, 
Kageki Shoujo is the new anime standard bearer for tall girl supremacy. This perfectly fluffy angel of chaos before you is Sarasa Watanabe, and her irrepressible Genki attitude and total inability to read a room are about to cause some major shakeups at Japan's most prestigious and competitive opera academy, where, despite knowing nothing of its legacy or the pedigrees of her esteemed classmates, she plans to rise up and become the school's top star. First to feel that shakeup is her roommate, Ai Narata, who came to the school after some traumatic and controversial fan interactions forced her to graduate out of a promising idol career. Now, you'd think that an idol trying to escape from her past would like the only girl in school who has no idea who she is, but unfortunately, Sarasa's general lack of respect for boundaries means at least at first, that's not much comfort to the ex-idol. This series seems to have some interesting things to say about the entertainment industry in Japan, and it packages that with an entertaining cast of the sort of eccentric characters you'd expect to see pursuing a life in the fine arts. It also features some absolutely breathtaking shot compositions and animation backed by beautifully timed orchestral music, implemented by the same sound director who did Beck, Akudama Drive, and Love Live, that give this cute dramedy an appropriately theatrical flair. Out of all the new shows I've seen this season, Kageki Shoujo is the most immediately charming, and if it goes on to explore these immensely appealing characters in more depth, I think it could be the season's sleeper hit. Though maybe that's just the theater kid in me talking. The exhausted millennial in me suspects that the underlying themes of the also underwatched life lessons with Uramichio Nissan might resonate a little more broadly with more anime fans. The series is named for and stars the gymnastics coach host of a low budget, public access looking children's variety show where day to day he leads groups of kids through fun exercises and games with a creaking, strained smile that doesn't at all hide his exhaustion, anxiety, and crushing despair over seeing all his high-flying acrobatic dreams reduced to this. Though it could be worse, he could be one of his acrobat college kohai stuck in embarrassing mascot costumes that they're too terrified of their senpai to take off until after they've gotten some beers in them. And at least the director is also phoning it in so hard that Uramichi never needs to worry about getting in trouble for busting out his inner Sako on a bunch of impressionable children or all but cracking when one of his tyke co-stars innocently asks him why he's not a daddy yet when he's 31. As anime goes, this adaptation is, well, barely more animated than its source material, but it does at least translate the manga's subtly evocative reaction faces faithfully with strong comedic timing. And that's kinda all it needs to do, especially backed as it is by stellar voice acting from some of the funniest seiyus in the business. Uramichi's played by Zetsubo Sensei and Saiki Kusuo's Hiroshi Kamiya, the mascots are Gintama's Gintoki and monthly girl's Nozaki-kun himself, and maybe best of all, Mamoru Miyano plays a gutter brain singer co-hosting alongside Nana Mizuki. These performances are just gold all the way down. If you care about great voice acting or great animation or just great production values in general, then you'll also want to keep an eye on the case study of Vanitas, whose core cast includes Tanjiro, Genos, Hestia, and Menma, and whose director, Tomoyuki Itamura, has more than proven his chops when it comes to supernatural action with the Monogatari series. Though I must confess, much as I adore the whole Shaft Nisio Isin aesthetic, I'm even more enamored with the ornate post-Napoleonic steampunk opulence that characterizes this show's fantastical and historical vision of Paris, where our titular 
titular hero, Dr. Vanitas, uses an ancient grimoire to save the city's secret vampire population from the insatiable bloodlust that consumes them when dark forces corrupt their true names. It's not clear if his intentions are wholly altruistic, though, and the show's other hero, a vampire named Noe, isn't ready to trust him just yet, not without good cause. Though Noe is the type to sprint halfway across a crowded atrium to catch a lady as she's falling, so he'll probably end up helping the doc either way. And as I'm personally nearly as much of a sucker for uncertain and conflicted shonen ensemble relationships as I am for steampunk, I think I'm going to enjoy their interactions immensely. Even if the writing doesn't hold up through the whole season, though, Itamura's at times intentionally jarring direction is perfectly suited to both the show's superhumanly fast action and its more psychological supernatural elements. And once again, it's studio Studio Bones doing the animation, so, like, just look at it, man. What's more, that beautiful action is backed by an equally beautiful score composed by the goddess of fate herself, Yuki Kajiura. Also, she did Madoka Magica and Sword Art Online and Pandora Hearts, which is from the same mangaka as Vanitas. Point is, though, the music's amazing and perfectly suited to this beautiful world. Everything about this show is amazing from a production standpoint. It's a real treat for the senses. Speaking of impressive animation and musical superstars, though, a certain subset of anime fans just had their ears perk up because, yes, today, for the first time in Jeff Thu history, I am recommending a Love Live. Specifically, Love Live Superstar, the latest iteration and generation of Sunrise, Kadokawa, and Bandai's intensely beloved School Idol franchise. I've been interested in giving these shows a go ever since Zombieland Saga opened my eyes to the feel-good, girls-supporting-girls potential of the idol genre, a thing that Love Live Live's longtime screenwriter, Juki Hanada, is the absolute best at. Sadly, though, much like Sunrise's other unstoppable cross media merchandising machine, Gundam, the sheer quantity of continuity that appears to be contained within the mainline series of Love Live kept me at bay for a good long while there. I needed a fresh jumping on point, and Superstar delivers that and then some. It's got everything the franchise is known for. Beautiful music, beautiful er animation, especially in its best-in-class CGI dance sequences, and kawaii-ness out the ear holes. Plus, gorgeously vibrant background art that's packed with an absurd amount of detail, much of it animated. You won't see many anime movies this side of Studio Ghibli that look this good, and it's not just for show. The cinematic, information-dense, musically energized direction and storyboarding keep the show's plot moving at a rapid pace without dropping anything from its surprisingly heavy load of character development and world building. The traditional music academy these girls are about to idle in has some interesting history and literal class divisions that seem worth exploring and create a rich backdrop for what are shaping up to be some very personal stories about overcoming insecurities and social pressures. These wannabe idols, especially our heroine Kanon, who loves to sing but suffers from severe stage fright, grabbed me faster and harder than the cast of any Moe thing I've seen since maybe a place further than the universe. And if that doesn't immediately tell you that this story has potential, you clearly also need to watch a place further than the universe. If you have already, though, and your life has felt tragically devoid of anime penguins ever since, you should also watch The Aquatope on White Sand, the latest original anime from PA Works and Lull in the Sea director Toshia Shinohara. Coincidentally, this show also stars an idol, albeit a failed one who left Tokyo after losing one too many opportunities to younger and luckier colleagues, then headed to Okinawa on a whim, most to avoid the literal pity party waiting for her back in her small hometown. There, on the advice of a shady fortune teller who's actually quite lovely once you get to know her, Fuka Miyazawa wanders west toward the setting sun, has her hat stolen by 
either a young boy or a nature spirit, it, it's not entirely clear, and eventually ends up at Gama Gama Aquarium, a local tourist haunt that's also something else. Once inside, let's just say the fish call to her, and so she ends up begging the aquarium's deputy director, Kukuru Misakino, a high school girl whose brain is so full of fish facts that she turns in squid care essays as math homework to give her a job. The Aquatope on White Sand is an Iashike, or healing anime, that presents a captivating mix of grounded, human character writing and dreamlike presentation flourishes that occasionally verge into the supernatural. It likely won't be everyone's cup of tea, but for those of you who do really vibe with it, I think it promises to be an all-time favorite, and I would say that everyone needs to at least check out the first episode to see if that's them. On the subject of vibe check, how a Realist Hero Rebuilt the Kingdom failed its first one pretty hard for me with that title alone, but passed its second with Flying Colors by dropping a pitch-perfect Yu-Gi-Oh! reference at the end of an episode full of quality character comedy and solid management isekai politicking. It is definitely, as the Realist self-label indicates, ever so slightly up its own ass, as well as the collective asses of Japanese-educated civil servants, whom it positively are so good at civil and economic planning that a medieval king would willingly surrender his throne to one in sheer awe of his raw efficacy, but, like, that's not an unfunny joke, and neither are any of the other ones the show tells in its charmingly zany first episode. Its characters aren't exactly grounded, but they are well-realized and entertaining, good at bouncing off each other, and more importantly, the blunt, sardonic persona of our hero, Soma Kazuya. Plus, the comedy's not all that's on offer. Already, we've seen glimpses of suitably complicated maps, supply chains, and social hierarchies that should should present some interesting logistical challenges for Soma to overcome using his wits and modern socioeconomic theory, which is already my kind of isekai, and knowing that all that's going to be filtered through the kind of mind that would reference not just Yu-Gi-Oh's gloriously over-the-top dialogue, but also specifically the actual card game's notoriously finicky chain mechanics, I am stoked to see what kind of tactics he comes up with. Now, if that's not your kind of isekai, don't worry, there's six different ones airing this season that you can easily sub into this slot if you prefer. Dungeon of Black Company offers dark social satire combined with stylish visuals and an over-the-top asshole pro tag you'll love to hate. Seirei Gensoki Spirit Chronicles has some really interesting ideas about conflicting identities and motivations in reincarnated souls, but mostly feels like Sword Art Online without the online, and Drugstore in Another World is exactly what it says on the tin, and also the most 5 out of 10 anime I've seen in years. Sadly, you will not be able to sub Tsukimichi Moonlit Fantasy into that slot, because that show has earned its own place on this list through a combination of sharp-witted fantasy parody writing, reminiscent but not derivative of Konosuba, with unironically solid storytelling and world-building. Our hero, Makoto Misumi, is actually the child of two isekai expats who agreed to give their world's goddess their most precious thing one day in exchange for being transported to Earth. The god of Our Moon, Tsukuyomi, explains all this to Makoto on his way out of Our World, promising to erase the boy's browser history and destroy his porn collection if he'll just play nice with the goddess he's about to meet in spite of her abrasive personality. He agrees, but then he meets her, and she decides that he's too ugly to be a hero, so she foists her weakest blessing off on him, the power to speak all languages, which is actually really overpowered but not in a combat sense, and boots him out of heaven into the wastes at the edge of the world to live with all the ugly orcs and demi-humans. Or, more accurately, she boots him into the sky several miles above those wastes, where Tsukuyomi appears once more to give him one last pity power-up. 
Luckily, this isekai works on John Carter of Mars rules, where adapting to Earth has given Makoto superhuman abilities in his new magic-rich environment, so he survives the fall without incident, and from there goes on to befriend some orcs and start learning about their culture, along with this world's delightfully esoteric mystical magic system. That sense of mysticism, combined with the capricious and cruel nature of the goddess, gives this show a classical mythology sort of vibe that sets it apart from other isekai fare and helps to unite its more serious elements with its charming sense of humor. Old school fantasy fans in particular will find a lot to love in Tsukimichi. As for the season's final isekai, besides Jahi, which again won't be out till August, it's time for one more vibe check. Madhouse has just released an original anime about teenagers with superpowers trapped in a school that's slipping through dimensions, written and directed by Shingo, One Punch Man, and space dandy Natsume. It's called Sunny Boy, and I should not have to say a single other word about it. Sure, I could tell you that it's thematically fascinating, using its amped up Lord of the Flies concept to amplify and explore essential questions about humans and the society societies we build, I could point to how striking its stark pocket dimension setting is and how it uses negative space in its shot composition, editing, and sound design to create a powerful sense of atmosphere. I could also gush about how inventive its powers are and all the cool effects that are used to realize them, but really, it ought to be enough to know that one of the greatest animators alive today, who happens to be friends with most of the other greatest animators alive today, and has a knack for getting favors out of them, has finally been given free reign to make his own anime. And what's more, he's doing it at a studio that, historically speaking, has almost always given original works like this the backing they need to actually meet their potential. Much like Vivi was last season, Sunny Boy is as sure a sure thing as original anime get. If it's not one of the year's best, I will be shocked. I'll also be surprised if Remake Our Lives doesn't rank among them based on the strength of its initial episodes alone. Its plot about an economics major who tried and failed to make it as a game designer going back in time to take a chance on the dream art college he lacked the confidence to attend in his first timeline is a bit convoluted and wish fulfilly and totally ignores Kyoya's moral obligation to save the victims of the Tohoku earthquake, but the setting that plot sets up, an art college full of quirky students, the quirkiest and most talented of whom all coincidentally live in the same dorm, gives me mad pet girl of Sakura So vibes. And that is one of my favorite rom-com anime ever, so when I see an anime like it, where the characters are aged up a little, dealing with more adult problems and insecurities, and also all the women are insanely hot, and the ED puts them all in swimsuits, and they're all in college, which also bumps up the odds that that etchy stuff and the show's romance elements might actually go somewhere before it's over, I can't help getting excited. On top of that, the story itself, while convoluted, is quite well told. The time travel aspect isn't totally superfluous either, as Kyoya is now classmates with a group of future famous artists called the Platinum Generation, for whom he holds an immense amount of respect, which screws with his ego in some really interesting ways. Also, the script is really clever, if not subtle, in combining genuinely educational bits of information info about different artistic disciplines and storytelling methodologies and the theory behind them with exposition and foreshadowing for its main plot. Best of all, the parts of the show that matter most, the characters, are all instantly endearing and insanely memorable. If you're looking for a great rom-com this summer, Remake Our Lives is the one. And with that, those were the ones to watch for summer 2020. One. I, I'm sorry I put that emphasis on it like that, I just couldn't help it. Now, if you're willing to settle for a pretty good rom-com, our honorable mentions offer another option, Kanojo Mo Kanojo, or Girlfriend Girlfriend, a harem anime about two girls and their boyfriend who they live with. Its characters can be more than a bit cringy in how they communicate with each other, but at least they do actually try to communicate, which is rare for this genre. If you enjoy anime about moderately insane dumbasses in love, this one's a horny, heartwarming hoot. 
The manga's also up in Bookwalker's etchy summer sale until the 21st, just FYI. Remain, an original sports anime about a middle school water polo champ who lost both his memories and his skills after a car crash put him in a coma, also has some light romance in it and plenty of comedy to boot. It hasn't really delivered the hype that I come to sports anime for just yet, but its cast is immensely likable, as you'd expect from the writer of Tiger and Bunny, so if it picks up in intensity, it could get really good. Now, if intensity is what you're looking for and you don't care so much for things like coherent plotting and character writing, then both Death Battle and Five Seconds of Meeting and Peach Boy Riverside might suit your fancy. The former is your basic super-powered survival game thingy with a magician-y aesthetic and some decent mind game potential in the main character's unique ability, while the latter is a sane and fantasy adventure story set in a world beset by very creatively designed Oni, who can only be defeated by uber-powerful, vaguely psychotic Momotaros. It's a bit dumb, but the art style's tight, the character designs are amazing, and the speed with which its extremely graphic cartoon violence ramps up is just incredible. Last but not least, Tante wa mo shinderu or The Detective is Already Dead, is based on a light novel I've heard a lot of good things about. ReZero's Subaru is even a canonical fan, but after an apparently anime original first episode that I'd describe as immaculately polished dog shit, followed by a second that was way better written but also sort of bland, I've yet to see a reason to actually recommend the show itself. The convoluted core concepts definitely interesting and rife with emotional potential though, so I will keep watching to see where it goes and eventually report my findings. Now it's time to report yours. Let me know in the comments below which anime this season you're most excited about and why. And while you're down there, don't forget to check that pinned comment for any ongoing Bookwalker sales of The Realist Hero, Life Lessons with Uramichio Nissan, The Case Study of Vanitas, or Kageki Shoujo. I'm Jeff Thu, professional shitbag, signing out from my mother's basement.